everyone. It's Caroline Rosen with the Tales of the Cocktail Foundation. And I'm so excited uh, to be reporting from New Orleans today and to also have a few amazing people with me. Um, as you know, full, in, full hands in, full hands out is our weekly webinar series interviewing leaders in our hospitality industry. This year, this week, we are honored to be highlighting three movers and shakers in New Orleans, each leading groundbreaking Corona relief efforts. Uh, we're going to highlight a little bit about what they're doing, but specifically, if you've heard of Free the, Feed the Frontline NOLA, Louisiana Hospitality Foundation, or Cafe Reconcile, those are going to be the wonderful people that we're with today. So we've got Devin DeWolf with the crew of Red Beans, Jen Kelly, the executive director from the Louisiana Hospitality Foundation, and Caitlin and Caitlin, you, we just were going over how to say your last name, and now I, I felt like I had it, and now I can't say it. So how do you say your last name again? I'm Stanlin. Stanlin, uh, the Development Dire Officer of Cafe Reconcile. So thank you all for being on today. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. We were all just saying, for those that are tuning in, um, we've just wrapped up our second weekend of Jazz Festing in Place. And uh, for many of our viewers that come for Tales New Orleans in July, you don't get to enjoy this beautiful weather <laughs> that we're having here today. So we've all been rejoicing in that. At least we've had uh, an opportunity to do that. Well, guys, I just wanted to kick off and um, tell us a little bit about you and, and what you've been doing for our community during this crazy crisis. And Devin, why don't you kick it off? We, we've known each other for the longest out of this crew. <laughs> You've been helping back when there were tornadoes, you were helping with relief. So this kind of seems built into your DNA. You want to tell us a little bit about all that uh, you're at? Sure. So I organized the crew of Red Beans. And um, whenever possible, we try to use the crew as a force for good uh, in New Orleans. Uh, I'm also married to an ER doctor. And when COVID hit, I got to see in real time what it was like for the medical professionals. Um, and it's six weeks ago, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear about how bad COVID would be. And certainly it's been pretty rough for the New Orleans community, but it was looking like potentially, you know, catastrophic. And um, one of those days when my wife came home from work, she told me about a nurse bringing cookies and sharing them with everybody. And that was uh, March 16th, I guess. And the idea just kind of took hold because I knew the restaurants were about to go out of business or be very, very, very uh, precariously positioned with the changes that were going to come. And it seemed like a win-win opportunity to raise money, to buy food from our local restaurants, and then get that food delivered to the local hospitals where uh, people like my wife, the doctors and nurses and security, um, the cleaning people of the hospitals, all of those people were risking their lives every day. Right. And um, super stressed out about it. So we thought, let's send them some delicious food from some of the best uh, chefs in the world that we have here in New Orleans. And it kind of took off. Um, we actually ended yesterday. Uh, yesterday was our last day of uh, Feed the Frontline NOLA because we were spending $30,000 every day buying 2,300 plus meals for literally every hospital in the New Orleans area. Um, but we were... Uh, pretty thrilled with what we were able to accomplish. Um, you know, we raised over a million dollars. We spent over a million dollars supporting 25 musicians, 49 restaurants uh, and coffee shops, all of them locally owned uh, kind of neighborhood spots. And um, I think it definitely helped give a morale boost, uh, not just to the hospital workers, but to the chefs, uh, the restaurant employees, and hopefully their position to come back uh, quicker, um, you know, as they transition away from all the food that we were buying to the new normal. Um, so that's what we've been doing. It was a team effort. It wasn't just me. It was a lot of crew members, um, you know, 20 people or so volunteering all their time to help us do it. And um, now we're shifting gears and trying to create something a little bit more long lasting uh, called Feed the Second Line, which is really long term trying to think about protecting the elderly musicians and culture bearers of our city. Uh, because they're still very high risk. Um, they don't need to be going to the grocery store. And uh, we would like to raise money to buy their groceries and get it delivered and create some more jobs for some of the out-of-work musicians. 
Um, so we'll see what happens <laughs> one day at a time. Well, you're always coming up with so many thoughtful ideas and you're also an amazing artist. That's one thing that we haven't mentioned. Where, where can people around New Orleans, what are some of the key spots that if you haven't seen your artwork, they may be able to catch it? Um, there's some murals here and there, but, um, you know, I'm a schemer, so I'm always trying to scheme up an idea and, uh, I guess that's just how my brain works. So I'm happy to put it to good use and, um, you know, basically love New Orleans, uh, love the people here and just trying to figure out any kind of way to help is what I like to do with my time. I love it. <laughs> well, if you have a chance to go to Thalia restaurant or city greens on Ferret street, they have two beautiful murals of yours in addition to uh, obviously the murals around town. And if you want to join Red Bean, I know we can talk about it a little bit more because I know I always get tons of questions about crews, especially from our friends from across the globe. So we'll have to dive back into that a little bit later on. Um, Caitlin, you're with Cafe Reconcile, uh, an institution that I've been lucky to work with for a long time. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your position and what Cafe Reconcile does historically and, and how y'all have been helping through this and really, uh, I see y'all being a huge help as we get back to normal too, I guess, as you could say. Yeah. Sure, so my name's Caitlin. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Cafe Reconcile. We're a workforce training organization that traditionally serves opportunity youth who are age 16 to 24, helping provide them um, life skills and professional skills so that they can enter the workforce supported and um, with greater access to resources and support services. We um, traditionally offer 90 young people in a year the opportunity to They're in an eight week, um, it's an eight work training program. And the goal is to have everyone connected to a job or back into education at the end of the experience. Um, additionally, um, we aim to, we generally serve around 250 alumni, so folks who have graduated from the program um, so in the year, we'll usually see about 250 alumni come back and visit us and they'll um, just in need of some additional support services. So they'll have access to our mental health counselor, our social service coordinator and our, our um, youth advocate and social worker. And so the idea is that regardless of when you're with Reconcile and what your life is, what life journey you've taken, you'll always have a place to come back to. We're always a family. We're always there to help you navigate the twists and turns of life. Um, the way, you know, our kind of flagship, what we're known for is Cafe Reconcile, which is a lunchtime um, institution on Oak Sea Haley. We're open Monday through Friday, um, serving Southern homemade Creole cooking um, with a great crew and amazing team. And we also have a catering division that runs an event hall on our second floor. And since March 16th, our building has been closed due to the um, restaurant um, shutdown order from the city and the state and so as an organization we kind of had to ask ourselves what what becomes of us amidst this um, new environment and how do we take care of our young people and meet our mission in a new set of terms so um, we closed our doors on the 16th we converted all of our programmatic work with our alumni and our young people to a remote case management system um, and then we shut down our operations in the in terms of cafe and production. And in the last seven weeks, we've had this amazing transformation where our incredible team and our alumni have really worked together to just make the most of this situation and um, be as productive and as impactful as possible. So the way that's looked is our program team has worked with our alumni, about 86% of our alumni were unemployed and laid off within a week yep. and a half. Um, so that really put our young people into a serious level of crisis. So to give an idea of the volume of work, in the last seven weeks, we've worked with 200 alumni and the amount of case management we've offered them is the same volume we traditionally deliver in a two year period. So we're doing, double the amount of case management to make sure our young people have the services they need. And what that tells us is that our hospitality workers who are most vulnerable and who have come from really tough backgrounds are having are really in crisis at this point. So the way we've tried to address their needs has been um, in a twofold approach. 
We remotely do case management, and so we're doing virtual sessions, helping them apply for SNAP benefits, unemployment benefits, Medicaid, making sure they're getting access to other um, daily basic needs. And so um, that work on, goes on regularly throughout the week, um, virtually. And we're also, um, we've been able to do some client assistance grants. And once a week, we do Meals of Hope so that folks can stop in. They get a little cash infusion to buy them their, their finances or financial um, bridge loans. In addition to the incredible set of resources that Louisiana Hospitality Foundation, United Way, Ganoff have all offered. We're trying to do our part as well. Um, and then additionally, we kind of got creative and said, we've got two kitchens and our young people need things like access to food security. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability to do that. So we've been partnering with Second Harvest and we're a, a production site for them. So that's been great for us because that keeps our team active and engaged in our mission, both in the work that we do um, programmatically, but also in our, you know, our love of food and our love of New Orleans community and culture being shut down is really hard when you're a caretaking organization. So we've been able to use those talents to also help Second Harvest make sure we're meeting the needs of our broader community um, and done a lot of partnering work with a great group called the GNO Caring Collective, which is a grassroots team helping um, hospitality workers who are homebound make sure they get access to all the community support services too. That's so great. And I think it's so needed. And I honestly believe that as people in our industry start to transition back, what y'all offer for this amazing group of humans is, is something that more and more people are going to need across the board. So I wouldn't be shocked if y'all are soon helping spread the best practices because it's tough. I mean, right now is so tough for everyone. And even as we look at this transition back to something, we all know it's not going to be immediately at the rate that it was. It's not going to look the same, right? And so no. we're so lucky that some of our, some of the future leaders and also some of the most vulnerable have y'all as a resource. And I, I just, I'm so excited to hear that. And again, I'm always watching what y'all are doing because you really are doing some of the best work. So thank you for sharing that and doing all the hard work there. And that perfectly, Jen, to you, tell us what you're doing. I mean, Louisiana Hospitality Foundation, it sounds like you've got like 50 people working for you. I know that it's, it's you, you're the one that really, you've got to, it, it's mainly you. You might have a little bit of a tiny, tiny team sometimes, but y'all have been making such an impact. Please let us know wh what's been happening in your world. Well, Devin mentioned he's a schemer. Um, I'm a networker. So um, <laughs> gratefully, uh, the, the networking uh, over the years has prepared us to have a safety net of partners that we were able to activate with when the pandemic was uh, hitting our community. So uh, Louisiana Hospitality Foundation before pandemic was a relatively small organization that focused on providing uh, grants in two different areas for our state's hospitality industry. We gave grants to education uh, facilities or programs that would focus on industry. Um, and that looked like a lot of different things. There were high school programs, there were universities, technical colleges, um, other private programs, and they were one-time grants. Um, right now that work is on hold. Um, and then we were also providing what we called crisis grants to hospitality workers mm -hmm. when they would have some sort of emergency outside of their control. And the easy ones to describe are a house fire or a car accident. Um, but other things, every application was a unique application. Sometimes it was a medical situation that would cause somebody to not be able to work for a period of time. And they would apply to us for a one-time grant. And we never really made any prob anyone's problems go away financially, yeah. but giving them a hand up when they really didn't have many resources to go to for a financial uh, grant as an individual, um, that was some unique work that we were doing in the community. And um, now we're able to continue that in a much larger, a quantitative impact. Um, typically, we might help 50 to 80 people per year. And now we are managing in a partnership with United Way, a relief fund called Hospitality Cares. Oh. And uh, like I said, we had this relationship before the pandemic where we were working together under the partnership brand Hospitality Cares. And we activated that 
um, when we realized that there would be the opportunity to attend, potentially acquire funding to distribute into the community. So we are uh, managing right now, we're almost at 4,000 applications. Wow. Um, they are from a seven parish area around New Orleans and um, it's all hospitality industry related and people that are approved for the funding get a one-time $500 grant. That's great. So that, that's, it, it's, it takes a lot of time. You know, Caitlin was talking about how they're doing two years worth of case management in a, a matter of weeks. Um, we've never tackled anything at this capacity. So with the partnership of United Way, um, we expect to be given out $2.1 million um, into the hands of hospitality workers who've been impacted by the pandemic. And then we also have a second program that is pretty unique. Um, it's a B2B uh, project where we're helping bar owners who have been impacted, who are still closed. Um, so as part of how Louisiana governor's managing the pandemic, he has not allowed the bar community to reopen. So we were able to accept some seed funding from Crescent Crown, a local distribution company. And um, we are in the process of this week, we'll be giving out our first awards. And they are also a one-time $500 grant that will be distributed to bar owners that can uh, show that they were properly licensed within the state. And then those funds are intended to help with basic expenses, such as rent, utilities, um, payroll if they get to bring people back, cleaning, getting their business ready to be reopened. I think we lost Caroline. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's our that's our second pandemic program. So we have the hospitality cares program, which is helping the actual consumers and um, our hospitality workers, and then the bar fund helps our businesses who are um, unfortunately still closed across Louisiana. Yeah, that's incredible. Lola here, I see Caroline uh, lost internet connection. Hopefully we will get her back. But in the meantime, let's keep going and talking to y'all. Um, you guys are all working with really great programs. Um, I can, I'll start with you, Caitlin. What, what do you recommend, what resources do you recommend for out of work bartenders right now? I know you're working with a lot of different organizations. What's the first step if I lost my job and I'm feeling kind of lost? Um, I think the first thing that I would say, we've heard a lot that the, the overwhelming nature just, it's a lot. A lot of people have been through a lot of trauma in New Orleans. And so this experience is bringing back a lot of PTSD and a lot of anxiety and stress from all those previous disasters we've gone through and the fact that we haven't always had the resources we need um, to kind of carry us through. So I would say the first thing is to like find your center ground, stay focused, because the thing we've realized through this process is that um, you really have to have perseverance and you have to have patience to navigate all the social service resources that are available to you. So I think finding, you know, giving yourself some grace and some space is a big deal, but um, on Cafe Reconcile's website, there's a, a daily updated list of resources that anybody from the hospitality industry can access. It's got detailed information, links to websites. Um, you can always call our program team and ask questions if you want to just kind of decipher those out. But um, I think that that's a great place to start. And I also think um, places like Louisiana Hospitality Foundation's effort with United Way they're putting out a lot of really good resources. So starting with like, get yourself on unemployment as soon as possible. So you get some money coming in, register for SNAP. And all of those things are gonna take time. But um, if you can just sort of every day say like, I'm gonna accomplish this goal and recognize I'm not in the boat by myself and that there's great support systems in places like Metropolitan Health and Human Services, Children's Bureau, NAMI, to kind of say, if I'm getting overwhelmed, I just need a mental health check-in. Good to have you back, Caroline. Sorry, I really thought I could sit outside of this call. I've got new Wi-Fi, like I was committed to it. You know, we only have a few few days left of this in New Orleans, so I apologize, completely my fault, and my Wi-Fi still isn't as good as I wish it was. So. Okay. Okay. That's everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're talking about resources and tips for 
you know, if I'm a bartender and I just lost my job, um, Jen, maybe you can walk us through the process for um, your foundation. How, how do people apply for those grants? And so I mentioned before, there's two programs. So the one that's uh, set up for the hospitality worker, that would be someone who uh, before this impacted our community was uh, working directly for a restaurant, hotel or bar or an event staffing company or caterer. Um, they can go online to the United Way website and it's a, a page dedicated to hospitality cares. It includes the eligibility and required documents information all on one page, as well as the button click to apply. So that one's um, pretty straightforward. Hospitality cares is what you're looking for. And then if you are a bar owner and you have not already applied, we do still have the application open for the South Louisiana Bar Program. It covers 35 parishes, and we summarize that and call it the I-10 corridor. So if you're from South Louisiana, I-10 runs straight across the state from Texas to Mississippi. And um, pretty much all of those parishes in south of the interstate would qualify. So they can just go to the Louisiana Hospitality Foundation website. And right on our front page are buttons for both of the programs. And they're both online applications. We do encourage anybody that is considering to apply to read up on the programs first and make sure that you have your documents ready before starting an application because that will always make it the easiest process. Oh, and talking about resources, um, one that I didn't even know about, I'd say three or four years ago is now part of my daily vocabulary. Um, the 211 phone number is a non-emergency phone number that we direct everyone to. Whether they are, are qualifying for the programs we operate or not, it is a super simple, accessible 24-7 resource. You dial 211 from any landline or cell phone number. You'll speak to a, a counselor that's in your area, and they typically have a database where they can search all the programs and nonprofits and social services that are available in your area and help connect you to resources to help whatever your situation is. Maybe you have small children and you're lacking access to uh, child supplies, whether it's diapers or baby food, or maybe you're worried about your baby pets. There are also nonprofits that are focusing on um, access to pet food if you're struggling. So 211 has turned into um, an amazing resource that we're able to connect people with through anybody that comes through the Hospitality Foundation is encouraged or um, educated on what 211 might be able to do for them. And it's a nationwide program. <laughs> That's great. I love that. And I loved mentioning fur babies there as well. That is, yes. that is for kids to a lot of us. I know it is for me. So Very much so. I totally understand. Um, well, well, I don't know if you've asked this, but like as we start to move forward, I know that a, a lot of the things that we've learned from this, I think it's a two part question for me. It's like, how are you preparing? It sounds like Devin, you're obviously like transitioning into feed the second line. Um, but like, what are the shifts as we go back to the new normal that you're looking for your organization and how do we stay involved? Like how do, how do we keep up? Well, um, for the crew of red beans, uh, you know, we will plan our Lundi Gras parade, I hope, for next year. And until that time comes, we'll just try to give back or help the community. Um, I think a lot about our um, Grand Marshal, Al Carnival Time Johnson, who's like 80, and uh, Mr. Benny Jones, the leader of the Treme Brass Band, because as soon as COVID got here, um, I always checked in with them to make sure they were doing okay. And basically would, would say to them, if you need somebody to go to the grocery store for you, let me know, because one of our crew members would probably do that for you. And so we kind of started doing that immediately, as well as focusing on the restaurants and trying to help food love get to the hospitals. So I think the immediacy of the restaurant uh, struggle is kind of passing and the immediacy of the hospital workers is passing as far as they're settling into a routine now and they understand more about COVID now. So I think long-term um, for New Orleans, uh, we're gonna enter a rough summer where there's very little economic uh, opportunity because 
we're so reliant on tourism and now that's gone. Plus the summer is generally slow anyway. So all the musicians and all the uh, artists would have been making their, their money during jazz fest and French quarter fest. So we're going to enter into, I think a very long, tough summer. And at the same time, COVID is still here. It's not as bad or doesn't seem as uh, potentially devastating as it did six weeks ago or four weeks ago. But if you're Mr. Benny Jones or if you're uh, Al Carnival Time Johnson, you still need to be very careful and not go to the grocery store and not expose yourself uh, to risk. And um, we're going to try to help that process. So if we're successful, if people donate money to our crew uh, on second line, feed the second line dot org is the website we built for it. Um, we will basically be able to hire younger musicians to do the grocery shopping and do the delivering. And then the older musicians or older culture bearers of our city uh, can be protected a little bit by not having to leave their house and go grocery shopping. Um, so that is the plan. And um, we'll see what happens right now. We've raised uh, $16,000 as our sort of seed money. And hopefully people will donate like they did with Feed the Frontline because um, we were good stewards of the, that money and basically um, if, if we're entrusted by the donors to do it again, I think we have a good concept that can produce a win-win for the community. Um, but we'll see what happens right now. It's all a theoretical a scheme and, uh, Friday we'll actually deliver, uh, farmers market produce and some prepared food, uh, to 70 local musicians and culture bearers. And after that, we'll see what happens. So hopefully people will support us and, um, you know, maybe it can be a program that continues on in New Orleans past COVID. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. And I think, you know, you guys had um, so much force behind your first initiative that I certainly think this one is going to be wonderful. So thank you for doing that. Um, Caitlin, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, Cafe Reconcile has obviously gone through so many changes over this couple months? What do you see for the future? What's what's the plan of action moving forward? Yeah, we're looking at this time. We're kind of like Devin. We're starting to um, shift and imagine what a new normal looks like. So we've kind of broken it up to like, what's our immediate mission work look like? And what's our intermittent median of our intermittent mission work look like? Um, so for us, a big... Um, motivator for us is to make we feel like the best gift we can offer our community and our employment partners and the hospitality industry that supported us all this time is to to do our best to like stabilize and support that workforce so if they're not being um if their immediate crisis needs aren't being met then when the hospitality industry does come back online you won't have a workforce that's prepared to go back to work and can be effective and um engaged in a job that they really love so and be a part of that next new normal so we we feel that that's our immediate work is handling that stabilization and that crisis um, response our intermediate plans because we are a workforce development organization are is trying to say like maybe there are some intermittent jobs or some um some workforce opportunities that are open and available now where we can take skill sets that our young people already have and translate them into other industries. And that keeps us meeting the um, workforce needs of our community that keeps us safe and healthy, like jobs in healthcare, jobs in transportation and logistics, like all these things that we need right now, that keeps um, money and basic needs met for our young people. And then as the hospitality gets back up online, we can be a part of the process of saying, What's the safest way to create spaces of warmth and love and food and community and enjoyment, but do that in a new safe way and be a part of that uh, rebirth of hospitality in a new definition? We don't know what that's going to look like. And frankly, we don't. Um, it's, it's so far down the road that like predicting it is kind of ridiculous. So we're just kind of going with the flow and saying, Let's just see how it happens. Like, for example, today is the first day in 49 days. Cafe Reconcile is open for takeout. So if you want your catfish, <laughs> come on by. Yeah. Our famous 
fish is back and available. So we're thinking, like, this is like our toe in the water to say, like, what does that look like? We want to be a part of the bigger mission, which is our work with Second Harvest and making sure vulnerable families have food security. But we can also say, like, we can be a part of food production and the culinary scene in uh, small, gradual ways that um, are a part of defining the new normal. So. And all three of your organizations have done such an excellent job adapting so quickly, right? We're, we've all been forced to just very fast think on our toes. Um, Jen, let's talk to you about your organization and I know, you know, you are just inundated with work right now. Are you thinking about next steps? Yeah, I'm predicting that the month of May will be the winding down of the pandemic relief funding um, that work that we've been doing. Um, we have uh, been trying to share resources with our voice to uh, anyone and everyone in our industry across Louisiana. Um, some of the concern that we wanted to uh, find resources to distribute because you mentioned earlier, or you were uh, Caroline did that we're a tiny crew, um, but we have lots of partners. So we're sharing partner resources into the community. And one of our really big concerns is just financial literacy and making the connection for people to understand how the best way to manage every little penny they can get access to right now or priorities and to stay alert and aware of what's available in the community. Um, there's lots of fear of evictions, um, housing insecurity and things of that in our community. And we're trying to connect people with available resources. One of them, United Way, is doing um, a series every Tuesday, and it's free and accessible on their Facebook Live page, but it's financial literacy webinars, and it's tackling things that are pretty simple to some and game-changing to others. Um, there are people who are able to access financial resources now, and as we go through these phased reopenings, some people will have employment and some people won't. And those needs are gonna vary by household. Um, like Caitlin was saying, we were kind of going with the flow also on what that looks like. Um, you know, thinking further ahead, we know that we want to continue, you know, with the mission of the foundation. There's no expectation that we would do a mission review and change our work, but we would probably make some alterations within our programs reevaluate how a crisis grant would, what it would need to look like, what documentation would need to be available. Um, uh, we used to help people with emergencies. And like I said, you know, between 50 and 80 people a year, well, that's not what the expectation will probably look like over the next months, few months, I don't know how many months. So we're, we're afraid of not having the funding to support the need, but we also don't have any clarity on what the need is. So we're really kind of taking things day by day. And as I said, to summarize, we expect that our programs will stay the same, but likely have some sort of internal tweaking so that we can have a process that someone could actually follow. Like right now, I can't go and validate people's employment when they might not have a job to go back to. And it, it, it gets very complicated if we try to do what we used to do the way we used to do it. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Well, we are about wrapping up. I just wanna um, give everybody a chance to kind of say a final word. If you have a message for the audience, um, I mean, thank all of you for being here. This was really fantastic. And you are all really leaders in the community. So. Devin, do you have a couple words before we sign off? Uh, just thanks for the opportunity to come and talk. And nice to meet everybody else uh, on the internet. And um, yeah, I guess if people are interested, they can find out more at uh, feedthesecondline.org. And we'll see what we can do with that. And hopefully we can make a little progress and, uh, you know, one day at a time. And uh, so thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Caitlin? Yeah, thank you for having us and this opportunity to share um, the work that we're doing and also the uh, just to check in on our young people. They're, our, they're a great group of people and they're working hard through this experience. So any support anybody can offer them, I'm just, any, we're just grateful for. 
you can always stay in touch with us. We're doing um, a lot of daily um, social media posts on uh, sort of virtual service delivery content. So a Mindfulness Monday, or maybe a workforce development check-in series that we do on Wednesdays. Um, every Friday, we end the week um, with a word of the week with our coordinator, our mental health manager, um, Onassis Jones. And it's just great content to make yourself feel connected and feel inspired. So if you wanna join us for some of those sessions, make sure to check us out on social media. Thank you. And we'll wrap up with you, Jen. Well, I have been inspired by so many people doing so many things. Sometimes it might be a cash donation of five bucks or it might be a company that says, hey, we're gonna make this quirky t-shirt and send proceeds to a charity. I just think that the spirit needs to continue because, you know, we're starting to reopen, but change is going to take a long time and there will be people who will continue to need things. And sometimes they just need cheer. It's not always about money. Um, so I, I hope that the spirit of giving and the spirit of support continues. And if anybody is interested in continuing to learn about the Hospitality Foundation, um, we'll act, keep our website and social media uh, active, but the website's louisianahospitality.org. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, and bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Tails. Bye. Bye. <laughs>